Welcome, everybody, to this um, session on mosquito control. And I feel a little bit like, um, to use a pun, a sort of fish out of water here because um, ISNTD bites is my natural environment. I'm a bit of an invasive species, to make another pun. Um, I'm really interested to, to, to learn about the, 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 the water aspect and uh, to introduce something of the vector control and vector management aspect. Um, yet another major implication of water management. Anyway, let me push ahead. Um, have I pressed the wrong button here? Yeah, here we go. So, um, working for a consultancy, Xenex Associates, which is support, principally supporting um, technology companies bringing forward solutions for vector management, and particularly in my case, um, mosquito management. And in this talk, I want to talk about the implications of water management and, and the, the urban environment. So um, you may have seen this little graphic before, but how important are mosquitoes and what is the uh, deadliest animal? Well, um, quite well, well publicized that mosquitoes as, as a group um, cause more deaths than any other group, um, including um, human beings being second on the ranking. Um, <laughs> and then um, you know, other, other major problems you can see there um, on the sort of left-hand side of that, being a lot of those being vector-borne type um, diseases, and then you've got some of your traditional sort of scary animals. There's a lot of bit of publicity, but I'll just make the point about the, the very great importance in terms of mortality of uh, mosquitoes, um, and there's also, of course, the, the morbidity, which is a, a major factor. Um, <coughs> Over two and a half billion, probably the majority of the world's population are at risk from some um, mosquito-borne uh, diseases, um, most prevalent in the tropics, of course. So, um, maybe an obvious fact, but around about half of the mosquito's life cycle, or all mosquitoes, depends on the water environment. So water management is something to seriously think about. This shows the life cycle of, a, of an Aedes um, species, already had referred to the Aedes albopictus, um, and this is once you've got a decent temperature uh, regime going in a sort of tropical environment, you'd be looking at maybe a two-week life cycle, um, and with uh, several hundred eggs per batch, you can see how phenomenally quickly a population can take off in, in, in a season, and um, slows the life cycle with lower population. So you've got um, a cycle which involves um, eggs uh, for uh, larval uh, instar stages and a pupa all in the water environment. So if we can manage that environment, at least in theory, we can manage the population. Now, this is probably the most um, sort of important and relevant slide, looking at um, the urban versus the um, rural environment. So what, what's, what's in favour, um, if you like, of, of the mosquito um, in the urban environment? Um, are really mosquitoes more of a problem in the rural environment? Well, there's lots of features of the urban environment which are very favourable to mosquito-borne disease and are challenging to its management. Obviously, the high human um, population density, so you've got ready contact from vector to human, back to vector, back to human. The immigration into the, that environment from people who may be <coughs> infected and therefore introduce a, an infection pool which can be transmitted by the mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes tend to be more active um, in the evening and at night, um, and that may, there may be more behaviour, you know, movement of people in the evening and at night in a, an urban environment than a rural environment. Urban environments are warmer, and this is probably more applicable for the um, temperate climates than for tropical, but um, you've got that slight warming effect, which is quite significant, and if you look at climate change, for example, that's you know, of the order of the same sort of temperature differences, a few degrees of temperature increase in the urban environment can make some difference to the speed of the life cycle and the attractiveness of the environment for the mosquito. Where you've got household water storage, there are certain species, and we'll go into this, which really can thrive in that environment because you've got an intimate contact then between the human being and their household environment and the mosquito's environment. Discarded containers, um, refuse, um, anything which can harbour um, water. Shallow standing water um, in a city and, okay, gardens. Um, 
vegetation, horticulture, trees, plant pots, all with little resources of, of water for the mosquito. Where you've got open drainage with rainwater or sewage, again, mosquitoes can um, breed in that environment. Construction sites, abandoned sites, abandoned households, abandoned swimming pools, all provide an excellent environment for mosquitoes. Where you've got your river flow or canals and they're slow flowing, you've got some, some flooding on the banks, you've got vegetation um, and you've got shallow areas and you've got polluted water bodies, again, attractive to certain species of mosquito and obviously mosquito control is, is important and where that's not really working properly. So all that's actually magnificent for mosquitoes. On the other side of things, you've got opportunity with the urban environment to manage the situation, much more so in many ways than you have with the rural environment, because you can have, you've got uh, housing improvement uh, potential, you can have piped water, so you remove the water availability. If people are using personal protection measures in terms of, for example, um, uh, topical, topical uh, repellents, if you've got efficient main sewage, effective drainage, um, and minimize your open water environments, um, have effective rubbish collection um, and even around um, the, the household clearing your, your space from anything that can act as a, a water uh, reservoir. Um, if good water management through rivers, deep water, fish populations, clean, um, any urban water bodies, uh, again, populated with fish, steep-sided, no, no flooding, vegetation around the banks of the uh, um, lakes um, and if you've got an effective mosquito control so there's a balance there and an opportunity okay so this just shows not a particularly good slide but shows a sort of problematic type of water environment I think this, this, is, this is in Delhi you've got um, water accumulation poor, poor um, water control um, flood management uh, and drainage and it only takes you know that period of about a week for the mosquito larvae to emerge from that sort of an environment. It's a bit detailed, but it's just to show some of the key problem areas you can find, and some of these are really quite particular. I'll just mention a few here. So um, you've got water storage, um, <coughs> tyres, particularly if you have tyre dumps, um, there's an opportunity. You've got um, uh, any disposable containers, disposable cups there, You've got your water tanks um, themselves, they're not lidded and, and sealed. Um, you can have mos mosquitoes breathing, breeding there. Water reservoirs, any little opportunity, there's a grinding stone there. Construction sites, and in general, you get poorer water management uh, and higher pollution issues, as we are talking about here with regard to the whole wash initiative in the um, suburban slum areas. And that, that's, that's where you can have problems. Now, on the, on the other side, the right-hand side, perhaps a, a more affluent environment still presents an opportunity for mosquitoes, particularly in the tropics, where you have these little niches of plant pots, uh, um, gutters, um, uh, drainage, um, where, the waters, where the mosquitoes can, can breed. So I'll just highlight three different types of problem. These aren't the only three problems, but three different types of problem. Uh, malaria, we've already had mentioned as being a key uh, problem and one where um, mosquito nets and indoor residual spray and drugs can be highly cost effective in reducing the incidence. Well, what about um, water management? It's generally not a lead uh, issue for um, malaria control, but it becomes more important in the urban environment because the urban environment should be less amenable for the Anopheles species of mosquito, which prefer a natural, clean water habitat. <coughs> but you can have such hot habitats in um, uh, city environments, and many tropical cities and towns do present a, a risk of, of malaria. Um, for example, um, in India, there's the Urban Malaria Scheme, 131 towns and cities. You have incidence <coughs> rates, total number of cases in the 100,000 sort of area for malaria there, and you do have you know, a number of deaths. Um, so again, um, opportunities for the mosquito to uh, survive in the larval phase. Some of these are very temporary water 
uh, habitats, tyre tracks, broken water pipes, drains, gutters, etc. <coughs> Um, lymphatic filariasis I've picked because, um, again, a terrible disease, 120 million people affected, uh, maybe some 50 million with actual um, uh, physical symptoms and disfigurements and some really dreadful um, uh, situations. Um, this can be uh, spread by a number of species of mosquito, and the Culex uh, species are included. Um, these um, tend to breed better in more polluted waters compared to the Anopheles species. So where you have poor um, sewage management, um, there's more of an opportunity for the, for the mosquito. This shows uh, um, the uh, southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefiascatus, and the, egg, um, the eggs being laid by the female in a water environment. So um, three in five people still remain at risk of this in uh, India. And um, Although mass drug administration is the major route, the um, opportunity for vectors to transmit the disease is still uh, a, a major one. So again, th this one is more around the management of the um, polluted waters. And finally, in terms of an example, dengue. Now, this is a truly urban <coughs> uh, problem because the um, AD species which are involved essentially part of a group that is a natural tree hole dwelling type environment. So adapting themselves to relatively clean water, little pockets of water um, in a city environment is really quite natural. So they, they become adapted and can live very close to the, to the human beings. Now, there's been a massive, massive explosion of dengue over the last several decades from some 900 recorded cases in the late 1950s to some 900,000 recorded cases um, in, in the, the last decade. And the geographical spread has been phenomenal across the tropics. Um, this is to some extent a resurgence of the species from previous control, which was part of the sort of DDT program. Um, very difficult to manage, but again, the reduction in the availability of uh, water um, and these pockets of clean water is critical. So what about examples of, uh, example of a problem with increase, what happens if you increase the standing water? There's a, um, an awful example in Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan last year with a series of explosions um, in the um, gas uh, main system in July, which um, completely disrupted an area of the city and you can see there's actually a, a car there at the top there, sort of in, in, in this it's a ma massive explosion. And this led to uh, an availability of, sort of uncontrolled standing water, combined with then high rainfall following that um, and extraordinarily high temperatures um, and the need for reconstruction, the construction work that's going on anyway in the city. You can see sort of water bodies there. And this led to some tenfold increase in the incidence of uh, dengue in the city transmitted by both species. So there's just an example of what happens if you increase the availability of, of standing water. What happens if you actually try to effectively manage the availability of standing water? Well, this is the example of um, the Khartoum area, which includes uh, urban, uh, peri-urban, and uh, rural, but it's dominant with the urban and peri-urban environment. And by reducing the availability of the, of the larval habitat, broken water pipes being repaired, these water basins uh, being removed, um, irrigation canals um, in the peri-urban environment um, being kept clear, um, using an intermittent pattern of irrigation, whereby you have some dry periods, so there is not a continuous availability somewhere of a water body. Um, La okay, thank um, larval uh, habitats um, uh, being drained and treated, and this was a community activity involving thousands of, uh, of, of school children who were mobilized to uh, identify, destroy, or treat water bodies, and the introduction of the mosquito fish, uh, Gambusia, into appropriate water bodies. <coughs> has been associated at the same time with this massive reduction that shows the proportion of deaths um, 
uh, down to malaria, you know, reducing from 16% to below 1% over that period. There are other factors involved, so it's a little bit difficult to pin it down totally to improve water management, but that was a, obviously a key, uh, a key um, achievement. Okay, um, what can you do about the remaining water bodies and um, water management um, in terms of uh, reducing the availability of water is, is not the only thing to think about. Well, you have, you have insecticides, this is, this is my background, but any of these um, factors, these ways of controlling the population in the established water bodies is not a complete solution. Um, you can have extended control, this is an insect growth regulator. You obviously have a, a natural type control, such as the mosquito fish. You have physical controls, for example, covering your water containers, your water tanks, to prevent the access of the mosquito for egg laying. And you have some uh, microbiological type control agents which can be used. Now, the aim should be to have a good integrated mosquito management solution. This shows you a, a natural sort of population growth curve which would be through the hot season or the, through the rainy season coming up from a low base quite quickly and eventually declining as the conditions become less suitable for the mosquito. So a natural <coughs> population growth curve. So what can you do about that? And a traditional uh, sort of control program might try to hit the population when it gets up to a dangerous level that might be causing a disease transmission so you could apply, you could spray, space spray, for example, to control adults, or you could be using indoor residual sprays or some other method. But that tends to have a relatively uh, temporary effect, particularly a space spray is only um, temporary. And so you would see something like that with the growth curve, a, a relatively rapid rebound, so you'd have to continue the activity. Well, there are some new technologies. I'll mention um, one now. This is the release of insects um, which have a self-limiting gene technology. That's one area that I've been supporting um, Oxitec um, on, and uh, this is a variety of the sterile insect technique. So you may be able to move the population continuously down by these releases, and this works by releasing effectively sterile uh, male insects so they're not uh, going to be biting anybody. The males don't bite, and so um, with the sterile insects you can reduce the ability of the population to continue to um, reproduce because the larvae from those sterile magnetings don't survive. So you could drive the population down. But you don't really want to be going up and down in this pattern. So what, what you really want to be doing is to be using what I'm calling source reduction, reducing the availability of those water bodies for the, for the uh, population. So you've got a lower carrying capacity in total for the species. Um, and then you can use the larvicides, I was mentioning in the previous slide. Um, you can combine that with some new technologies um, and then try to keep the whole growth phase of the population down below any transmission threshold for the disease. So that's the sort of technical ideal solution. So I'm winding up with a very fine slide. And um, this is just the conclusion. So some um, mosquito species, and I mentioned three groups, transmit um, um, diseases that cause major problems, major um, levels of death and, um, uh, and morbidity. Uh, all mosquitoes require <coughs> water for the larval phase um, and the availability of suitable water habitats determines the abundance. And then finally, management of the water supply, um, a sewage treatment and uh, the prevention of that standing water. Those are the ways to reduce the risk of uh, mosquito-borne disease transmission. Now, to achieve that, uh, you do need an intersectoral approach. So you, it's not one single department or body that's going to be responsible, and certainly not the mosquito control guys who are going to be able to drive that for you. It's going to have to be an integrated management solution involving the health services, the mosquito control services, um, the, the water supply, sewage, drainage, urban planning, and the construction sites. Those construction sites are very good ways of producing lots of mosquitoes. Agriculture, particularly if there's peri-urban agriculture involved, the refuse collection side of things, and critical to involve the community, um, those water bodies that are very close by people's properties or even in people's pro properties, they need to be aware of how dangerous they are and to have a community campaign to eliminate them. So thank you very much. <coughs>